You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hey, friends, this is Melissa from God's Favorites, a history podcast where we talk about people in history who were God's favorites with the stupidest luck you've ever heard of or the people who just thought they were God's favorites. Henry VIII, I am looking right at you right now. You can also find me over on TikTok at Melissa Fair Lady, where I do a lot of history content. Y'all know I love me some queens, and that's why you're here. This is Queen's Podcast with Katie and Nathan. Prepare yourself for queens, cocktails, and curse words. And if you don't like the latter, this may not be the podcast for you. But come on, who doesn't love a well-placed F-bomb? You've been warned, peasants. Kidding. Enjoy the show. And come check me out over on God's Favorites, a history podcast. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about women in history. Hey, Nathan. Hey, Katie. Hey, Queen's Harry. Hey, and welcome back to another episode of Queen's Podcast. Happy St. Patrick's Day. We're recording this on March 17th. Happy St. <laughs> Patrick's Day, Nathan. Happy St. Patty's Day. And instead of drinking beer, I'm drinking champagne because I'm a bougie bitch. <laughs> Nathan, tell us who we are talking about today. We are talking about Kosem Sultan, and she is one of the most powerful women in the history of the Ottoman Empire, which Ooh. going through a period known as the Sultan of Women, which was a time of, a, of about 150 years in the Ottoman Empire where consorts and queen mothers were just slaying it. Yes. And also, Nathan, tell us what we're drinking. Yes, we are drinking a mimosa. Duh. And it's got papaya and guava. So it's a papaya guava mimosa. Just a little vodka shot. If you do a vodka shot in that mimosa, make sure it's like citrusy. Like you want. Yes. Oh, like a lemon or like a raspberry vodka or something. Raspberry is what I did. Thank you, Katie. Love it. You're (laughs) welcome. It's great. It's great. Just, just like our girl. Disclaimer up top. We've listened to a lot of other podcasts and YouTube videos and tried to get the pronunciations of these names down, but all of them have different variations. So, hey, if we are not pronouncing it the way that you've heard before, please don't just go leave us a bad review left on that. Leave us a bad review because of the dick jokes we'll probably make. (laughs) But you can always send us a voice note or something with the proper pronunciations and we can fix it next time. How about that? Yes. Get- so Kosem Sultan was born in modern day Greece in around 1589. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> don't know when she was born. Surprise, Not surprise. Sure. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. She was born in absolute obscurity. We're not even sure if her origin is modern day Greece Maybe Italy, maybe Bosnia. (laughs) I kept running into that the common story is that at her birth, her name was Anastasia and that her dad was a Greek Orthodox priest, which is like Roxalina's dad was maybe a priest as well. But again, we don't know for sure. And side note, before we even get started, so much of this woman's early life is just like copy paste from Roxalina's story. Roxy, Roxalina. I really do think Kosem was inspired by Foxy mm-hmm. Roxy. So if you like the story, maybe check out that one too. This part. I'm sorry, is horrifying. When she was about 14 or 15, yay, raiders came to her village and kidnapped her. No. That's what happened to Roxelena as well. So I guess this was like Mm -hmm. something that on top of everything else 
from old ye old timey days being horrifying, you also had to worry about getting raided and kidnapped all the time. It was not a great time to be a woman. Mm -mm. So she is kidnapped. She's like 14 or 15. And we have no information about what happened to pretty much anyone else in her village. So like, were her family murdered? Were her brothers and sisters also enslaved? Or her parents? Yeah. We just don't know. We just don't know. Yeah. we, We have no idea. But... She was taken to an auction in Bosnia where she was bought by a high-ranking Ottoman general. Mm -hmm. Because history's just a little bit horrifying. (laughs) God. Yeah, she was taken to the royal harem in modern-day Constantinople, which was Istanbul. Istanbul, Constantinople, you know, Istanbul, Constantinople. Constantinople. (laughs) (laughs) We really need to get the the rights from They Might Be Giants to let us use that song sometime. I know. know. But this was all because the guy who bought her wanted to get ahead with the sultan. Right. And okay, look, is this bad? Oh my God, yes. Mm -hmm. Horrifying. Mm -hmm. She's been... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She's a young girl. She's been violently ripped away from her family and sold into slavery. But she's heading to the royal harem. I mean, you're kind of a sex slave. Kind of, yeah. yeah. The reason she was brought to the harem was because Kosum was fucking hot as hell. Smoke show. She got the nickname Mape Kur, which was Turkish for moonlike face, which apparently back then was a compliment. I don't really know what that's supposed to... Does that mean round? It's a compliment. Was it shiny and super <laughs> white? Did it glow in the dark? Like, what does that mean? But what we do know was that she's tall, thin, got very pale skin, I think the moon, with brown dark brown eyes so she's pretty and she's immediately turning heads everywhere she goes which yay i mean i guess if you have to be an enslaved sex worker at least it's nice that everyone's looking at you i hate it here (laughs) so for anyone new to queen's podcast queen's podcast 101 nathan what's a harem so it's a palace but It's for all the women who are the concubines of the sultan. So it's a lot of politics Mm -hmm. involved. Women are around each other 24-7 fighting to be the top dog, basically. Yeah, men and women are kept very separately in this society, yeah. Yes, so that would have been almost certainly intimidating for her to come into this situation of not knowing the culture. Now you got to fight for your life. Yeah. Whoa. Typically the mother of the Sultan was like the manager of all the girls in the harem. The momager. The momager. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> whole, it's Christianer. <laughs> it's just in there being like, you're doing great, sweetie. Absolutely. <laughs> so as a Royal concubine, and a possible mother to sons from the sultan, you don't just get thrown into bed with the sultan right away. She's got to go to school. She's got to go to concubine school because these are like supposed to be the the most refined ladies in the Ottoman Empire in the harem. I, can I go to concubine schools, y'all? You want to go to concubine school? I have a feeling you don't actually want to no, go to No, no, in either. theory I do. But <laughs> in the harem, she starts to learn religion. And like we said earlier, she mm-hmm. was probably raised Greek Orthodox, which is Christian based. But in the Ottoman mm-hmm. Empire, they practice Islam. And we don't know if she had any issue changing a religion because she didn't show it. Because she... She leaned into it and learned all of those customs and picked up on everything really fast, which is a major indicator that a girl is smart, y'all. So religion wasn't the only education she was getting. She was taught to read, do math, sewing, singing, playing musical instruments. This is all kind of similar that we hear the typical princess education, you know, Mm -hmm. but she was getting straight A's. She was nailing it. She just took to this life like a fish to water. And before long, it's obvious to everyone that she is going to be a major contender for the Sultan's affections. 
And speaking of the Sultan, let's get to know him a little bit. Nathan, will you tell us about him? Yeah, his name is Ahmed mm-hmm. the First. And he's a baby. He's just a little baby. He's either Kosem's age or a year or two younger, which means he's like 14 or 15. But how nice is that, that it's not like... A 50 year old dude <laughs> oh well, yay when let's, she's 14 or 15 celebrate gross misogyny yay let's take the wins where we can get them yes yeah, so that means and ahmed, ahmed are like roughly the same age but it also means like he he's probably he's gonna be easily swayed because he doesn't really know what he's doing uh... you know what i mean yeah no he's young he's dumb mm-hmm. he's full of hmm. okay <laughs> And that's why we get the bad reviews. <laughs> Don't leave us the bad reviews for the bad pronunciations. <laughs> leave it for that. Truth. But <laughs> we know at this point, he either had one son or his main concubine at the time was pregnant with that son. So her name was Mafuraz. Nailed it. Nailed it. And she was Ahmed's first consort, but never really his legal wife. He only yeah. had two consorts in his life. Don't worry, he's still got plenty of concubines. Yeah, he could have had, I want to say it was like up to four consorts at one time. But he only had two in his life. And we never hear from Mafuraz again. So, bye girl. Uh, <laughs> but she is either pregnant or just had his son. So Ahmed was actually the youngest sultan to ever father a son at 13 or 14. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Cool. Ahmed has gone down in history as a bit of a softy because he didn't like killing his brothers. Wait, what? (laughs) Yeah. Let's take a second to explain how inheritance worked when it came to sons of a sultan. Because unlike, yeah. Unlike most of our episodes that we've covered in the Ottoman Empire, it wasn't a given that the oldest son of the Sultan would be next in line for the throne. Mm -hmm. Instead, basically, when the Sultan died, all his sons would just kill each other. And whoever was left standing was Sultan. So it's kind of like Hunger Games, except you're all brothers. (laughs) You're all from the same district. I mean, uh, yes. Yes. None of these sons were safe, regardless of if your brother is mentally challenged or only a toddler at two years old. You gotta kill him. Yeah, someone's gonna get you if you don't get them, is the, the whole vibe here. And typically, once the sultan had a son with one of his concubines, he... He stopped sleeping with that concubine because they didn't want to have two brothers that are like full brothers because it's going to make them harder to kill their brother if they're like, you know, same full sibling. So that's that's what's going on here. (laughs) Yeah. And the method that they would execute the sons of the Sultan was called the silk rope. We talked about this in the Roxalina episode too, I think. Yeah, we did. Because you would literally get strangled with a silk rope, which not super creative in the execution name here, guys. Maybe we should round table this. Spitball! No wrong answers. Let's hop on a whiteboard. <laughs> Come Let's on, figure this guys. Out. No. But to paint a picture, Ahmed's dad, Mehmed the third, had 19 half-brothers. 19? Yeah, 19. And he had all of them executed with the silk rope. And they say that some of the brothers were blind, some oh. were deaf. Oh, you know, and back then in the 16th century, you're never going to, no one's going to be electing you mm-hmm. sultan if you were, if you had a disability like that. But he just didn't take any chances. Basically, everybody in the Ottoman Empire, that was kind of like the last time that they were like, before people started to be like, oh, wow, this is a bad look. Like, that was <laughs> a lot of, it's a lot of oh, dead brothers. This is not great. For us. Oh. We're not looking like a modern day empire <laughs> with this practice, you know? Yeah, because the practice of fratricide pretty much become very unpopular mm. with the general public. So Ahmed is like, yeah, I'm not going to lean into that look because it's yeah. not a great look. It also helped that he only had one brother. Ahmed had a brother named Mustafa, 
who, um, he was only two when their dad died. Okay. And so he was like, I'm not going to kill my two-year-old brother. And also, if he killed the two-year-old brother... Then when, if he died without sons, it would be the end of their line. Because that's the other thing. He doesn't have uncles because the dad killed all his brothers. They're all you know, dead. Yeah. There's, not, there's not like a wealth of family members that can take on the role. So we're, it's a mix of both. He was like, one, I don't want to kill my two-year-old, two-year-old brother because it's a bad look. And two, what if I died tomorrow and I don't have any, with no sons, what do we do then? So that was kind of, uh, yeah. But instead, Mustafa was sent to live in the harem that, like, retired concubines went to live in. So, like, his grandmother's there. I think it was called, like, the Palace of Tears or something. So it's like... Oh, dramatic. I know. (laughs) Where do you live, the Palace of Tears? The Palace of Tears? (laughs) So Mustafa, baby Mustafa, was sent to live at the Palace of Tears. And it's heavily, heavily, heavily guarded so he's not dead, but he's also not free. And I swear this will all be important later. But another important political piece of the puzzle is that there's a vacancy in the harem. Oh. For a really long time, Ahmed's grandmother, a.k.a. the concubine formerly known as Chris Jenner. <laughs> yeah, his grandmother had been the manager or the momager of the harem. But she had been exiled to that far off harem along with Mustafa. Hashtag poor baby Mustafa. It only gets worse. Don't Google it. And then Ahmed's mother had been the manager of the harem, but she had just died too. There is an empty seat at the table. All of that is to say is that there's no manager of the harem. There's no momager at the moment. So I'm back to Kosem, shall we? All of that was important, we promise. So um, Kosem is killing it. Um, Straight A's at harem school. And so she's finally presented to Ahmed. And it said that he fell in love with her because of her beautiful singing voice. But we have a sneaky feeling that that banging bod and pretty face probably had something to do with it, too. And we believe that sometime during their first year of them knowing each other that they were legally married and she was given the title Hasiki Sultan. The first woman to ever have that title in Queen's podcast alum was Roxelena. Foxy Roxa. Elena. Yes. So again, that's why I think that that's uh, why Roxelena is kind of cosim. She's like, this chick had the right idea. I'm going to do what she did. Mm -hmm. Again, in this culture, the Sultan, he didn't need to legally marry any of his concubines. Uh, Because, you know, their sons being quote unquote illegitimate, (laughs) it wasn't a big deal, you know? So if he legally married anybody, it was, uh, it, it was for love, really. I'm sure there was other political stuff, but yeah, it yeah, was because he wanted to, because he loved her. Yeah, and Ahmed is just lavishing her with jewels and money and dripping in love and laguanza. And she is now the top ranking woman in the empire. Not bad, not bad. And because there's no momager in the harem... The Chris Jenner position is wide open. She also takes on the resp- responsibility of running that too. And um, that's mm-hmm. when Ahmed gives her the nickname Kosem, which means leader of the herd. So he's basically being like, you're in charge. You know, some people just have a leader mentality, you know, and mm-hmm. she did. Guys, she was so smart. Yeah. And... Ahmed starts coming to her for advice instead of going to his advisors. So it's very notable that she's got a good head on her shoulders. Mm -hmm. And people noted that she was really shrewd in knowing when to actually speak her mind and when to step back and just be a listener. It reminds me of, I remember in my big fat Greek wedding when they're like, yeah, the man might be the head of the household, but the woman is the neck and she can turn the head, which it kind of gives me that vibes when she knows, I know when mm-hmm. I'm going to pick my battles here. I got to pick my battles here. Yeah. So Kosam starts popping out them babies and the first child was probably a son, but it's kind of hard to tell for sure. But We know Ahmed had around 10 sons and around six daughters. It seems like Kosum gave birth to seven or eight of those kids. So at least half of those kids, which again, 
it was usually once you had a son with a concubine, you quit having kids with her. He couldn't get enough of that coast I'm loving. Usually it's a hit it and quit it. Oh, that moon faced girl with the beautiful voice and the banging body. He was coming back for more. Because she seems to be the only person he ever had more than one kid with. But unlike her predecessor, Roxelena, she doesn't seem to be jealous of other women. Or maybe she was just hiding that part of it. Because you remember in the Roxelena episode when she, like, somebody brings him a new girl for, for the harem. So she. She like oh, pretends no. to pass oh, out, like, no. <laughs> like just, <laughs> yeah. and he's so worried about her that he's like, no, no, I don't care. I think yeah. Kosum was sort of like a little bit smarter with that, because mm-hmm. also oh, sometimes you need a break. Breach. <laughs> but all in all, the two had a very loving relationship, and though she didn't hold any official title or power outside the harem, she was definitely, and there was. There was no question about it. Everybody knew the behind the scenes. If you wanted something from the Sultan, you made friends oh, with Kosum, you know, because she was pulling the strings. Because she's pulling the strings with the kings. Pulling the strings with the kings. Ooh. <laughs> For instance, she got in really good with the Janissaries. The Janissary sounds like friends and it's just Janus. <laughs> the Janissary's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the janissary is like the sultan's personal guard like his military they're like the top of the loop and you know that's not a bad best friend to have she's got friends in her places because she also married one of her daughters off to the grand visor and the grand visor is kind of like prime minister so she's got allies all over the place yeah and Super gross side note, Blech. that daughter was only six when she married the Grand Visor, which uh, not a good look. That poor daughter was married off seven different times in her life. And like Ooh. her husband's just kept getting killed either in battle or executed. As time went on, Kosim was one of the chief advisors to the Sultan. But in the end, everything she did when it came to politics was mainly focused on keeping Ahmed from killing his brother. See, um, at this point, Ahmed had like five or six sons, and he was kind of thinking, okay, well, now that I have heirs, I don't need Mustafa still alive. I may as well just go ahead and execute him. Maybe I should just kill my brothers. But Kosem was so worried about her sons. She mm-hmm. was not the mother of the oldest son, so that son... Seemed to be the favorite of the king, so she felt like Ahmed needed to go on speaking against the old tradition of killing your brothers for the sake of her sons. Yeah, she's like, well, if he sets the precedent that we don't kill our brothers, then the next sultan hopefully won't kill any of my sons. Because if you have five sons, and the whole thing is you kill your brothers, it doesn't matter who becomes sultan next, some of your kids are going to get killed. Yeah, what a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, you want to have sons because the mother of the sultan has a huge place at court and is very powerful for the rest of her life. But on the other hand, uh, those sons have a very high chance of getting strangled to death, um, even if they're babies. Mm -hmm. So damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation. So Kosem convinced her husband not to kill his brother and this gave her peace of mind for now Ooh, well i love a little cliffhanger let's leave it there and we'll be back dreaming of a better sleep tossing and turning is not your destiny and ollie is here to help ollie invites you to sink into sweet sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness more than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. Was the Sphinx 10,000 years old? Were there serial killers in ancient Greece and Rome? What were the lives of transgender, intersex, and non binary people like in the ancient world? We're Jen and Jenny from Ancient History Fangirl. We tell you true stories and tall tales of the ancient world. Sometimes we do it tipsy. 
Sometimes we have amazing guests on our show, historians like Barry Strauss, podcasters like Liv Albert, Mike Duncan, and authors like Joanne Harris and Ben Aronovich. We take you to the top of Hadrian's Wall to watch the Roman Empire fall at the end of the world. We walk the catacombs beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent under Teotihuacan. We walk the sacred spirals of the Nazca Lines in search of ancient secrets. And we explore mythology from ancient cultures around the world. Come find us at ancienthistoryfangirl.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, and we are back. Let's fast forward a few years. It's 1617 and... Kosem is about 28 years old and has been married since she was 16. But now, sadly, she's a widow because Ahmed died suddenly of typhus, not syphilis. Not syphilis. Uh, <laughs> he died of typhus, not syphilis. I don't even know what typhus is. What is typhus? Um, good question. <laughs> tells us typhus fever is a group of diseases caused by bacteria that are spread to humans by fleas fleas lice and other little crawlies okay gross does not sound like a good time (laughs) no i'm sure kosem must have mourned her husband deeply but we just don't have a lot of information on it we don't know for sure, like how she was feeling about like, losing her love. But we know that she was real <laughs> nervous. Because remember, Ahmed had a son before she came along and started having mm. sons. And his name is Osman. And he's probably going to become Sultan. So our girl went into action mode to save her babies. She saw him as a threat and was worried he might kill her sons. So our girl turned on him. I mean, I'm not surprised. Basically, she very loudly supported a faction that said Ahmed's sons were all too young to be sultan. And that Ahmed's brother, Mustafa, should be the new emperor. So sultan's brother had never inherited the throne before. Because usually he's killed all his brothers. Yeah, they're all (laughs) dead at this point. But everyone seemed to agree that Mustafa was the guy for the job which Mm -hmm. was not a great idea y'all no mustafa did not want to be sultan in any way shape or form at all like like Tsar nicholas ii yeah yeah he had grown up in the isolated guarded ye old dusty harem ye old dusty harem (laughs) so he never got a proper education zero social skills and oh yeah He grew up his entire life paranoid as fuck that someone was going to come and kill him with a silk rope. Why would you think that? I can't can't, can't think at all why he'd be paranoid. Then, when Mustafa was a little bit older, so a few years into his life at Yield Dusty Harem, they moved him to a place in the harem literally called The Cage. It's not La Cage à la Faux. No. (laughs) In English, it's the cage, but in Turkish, which is what they were speaking then, it's the coffus. It wasn't literally a cage, but it was a part of the harem, like up on the second or third floor, with no windows, heavily guarded. He only uh, he only got to communicate with the eunuchs when they like came to feed him and stuff, and yeah, so. I can't possibly wonder why he think... I can't possibly begin to speculate why he's afraid he might not be equipped for the job. But yeah, despite his loud protesting, Mustafa was made sultan, thanks to Kosem and Company. Kosem and Company, yeah! Kosem and Co. I like that. (laughs) Kosem and Co. Now, Mustafa was super bad at being king, but Kosem was like, that's okay, because I got him the role... I'm going to have a part in the Regency because I've been so connected to politics over the last 14 years anyway. I've already been pulling the strings. I can just keep pulling the strings for sweet baby Mustafa who does not want to be here. Mm -hmm. But Mustafa's mom was still alive 
And she's been living in exile this whole time. And remember, the mother of the sultan just automatically has a high-ranking place at court. She comes back from exile. She takes over as regent. And she kicked Kosum and her four surviving sons out of Constantinople back to ye old dusty harem. Yeah. And Kosum was sent to more or less like a concubine retirement home. (laughs) I can go to there. Shitty Pines. (laughs) (laughs) In English, it's known as the Palace of Tears. He is my, yes. <laughs> my hometown, the Palace of Tears. So, <laughs> <That's> so dramatic. <laughs> she was treated well there, and she got to keep her youngest sons with her. But eldest son, Murad, was sent to the Kafis, a.k.a. the Cage. Okay, so we don't know a whole lot about Kosum's personality, since not a lot of her like personal letters survive all like her letters that survive are running shit like she doesn't have any diaries or anything but uh we know that she loved the fuck out of those baby boys that she had and she was very stressed out about them getting murdered as mothers tend to be (laughs) as one should so i imagine that when murad is sent to coffice she is probably super nervous you know yeah of course So let's fast forward. And there's the coup, (laughs) y'all. And Kosum has nothing to do with this coup. She's just sipping her sweet tea. But Mustafa had to go. Mm -mm. And he was not well mentally Mm -mm. and not crushing it at this point. (laughs) Not crushing it, as many famous historians have said. So he was overthrown and sent into exile in Yield, as you hear him. And he's only surviving 96 days as Sultan. Right. Like, I was reading one thing that, like, they'd be in the middle of equivalent to a meeting of the cabinet or whatever, you know, the parliament or whatever. And he would just like, walk up to people and just take off their hats and then just go sit down with the hat, like, in the middle. And everyone was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, like, that guy just, okay, baby. he just took okay, my turban. Baby boy. Okay. And, or he would just, they would catch him outside standing like over the pond, just talking to the fish in the pond. Good for him. I mean, one with nature, but he wasn't like on this plane of existence 99% of the time is what we're getting at. Yeah. Yeah. He's meant for another world. Yes. So now Osman, which is Ahmed's oldest son, is Sultan. And Kosum is nervous. And she's hoping that he'll remember, hey, I was kind to you when we you were growing up. And um, so maybe, maybe you'll return that kindness in not murdering my children. <gasps> what do you think? What do you think? Osman seemed to genuinely care for Kosum. Yeah. He was only 14. He didn't remember his mom. And he would come visit Kosem and all the other retired concubines and their concubiness. And <laughs> all the retired concubines, all the retired concubines, all the retired concubines. Now put your hands up. <laughs> Sorry. It's Beyonce for retired concubines, <laughs> a.k.a. the Palace of Tears. The Palace of Tears. <laughs> so, yeah, so he would go visit her. And I think that tells us that they must have had at least something similar to a mother-son relationship when he was growing up, because that wasn't the done thing that, that you didn't necessarily go visit your dad's other consort other. Yeah. Yeah. A little awkward at the family reunion. (laughs) It raised eyebrows, but I think that shows that Osman had a kind heart, you know, uh, and he he would come and give her gifts, and he made sure that she always had enough money. And Kosum gets to kind of relax for a while. Nice. Not all the way. She's definitely still worried that something will happen to make him change his mind about uh, fratricide. But, <coughs> yeah, for, for a, a couple of years, she gets to chill a bit. Yeah, and we don't really have time, but basically Osman pissed off Janissary. Um she was like, "Hey, no." no. <laughs> Chandler. You know what? Maybe maybe keep friends with your military. Maybe like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He ended up lowering their pay and closed their coffee houses, which Excuse me? Uh, coffee houses are huge. 
um, even today. Yes. I don't know. Spoiler alert. Um, a basic bitch loves her coffee. So <laughs> it was like, okay, this guy. This fucking guy. I can't get Starbucks anymore. He's got to go. <laughs> I feel like I remember one time reading something that's like a woman in the Ottoman Empire could divorce her husband if he made bad coffee. Yeah. That's how big (laughs) coffee was in this culture. So for them to be like, no, I mean, to be fair, if my job (laughs) tomorrow was like no coffee at work, you can't drink coffee at work. I'd be like, well, sayonara, motherfucker. It was was fun working here. (laughs) Yeah, I get it. Yeah, he's just pissing everyone off. And three years into the reign, 17-year-old Osman was strangled with the silk rope. So, Kosum's involvement is questionable. Did she help orchestrate it? Maybe. Maybe. (laughs) We don't love this because he seems like a nice guy that genuinely cared for Kosum. But remember... She's looking out for her kids. She's looking out for her future and her kids' future. So it may have happened. Yeah. She may have done it. So then one of her sons was put on the throne after this. <laughs> nope. They uh, put the still very mentally unwell and unwilling Mustafa back on the throne for reasons. We, yeah. We, we, don't, <laughs> we don't see them right now. And we may never. Because <laughs> Mustafa, I'm sure they were like, they're cu- they come in and he's like, oh, is it dinner time? They're like, you're Sultan again. And he's just like, God damn it. <laughs> Let's go, girls. <laughs> Let's go, girls. You are Sultan again. And he said, no, please. <laughs> so now Kosem's oldest son is about 10 when all of this is going down. And 11 is the youngest that anyone will accept as Sultan without a regent or w- even with a regent. And since it's kind of assumed that Kosem had something to do with Osman's assassination, we believe she made a deal with her friends in high places, like what they were going to do once her sons were old enough to be recognized as sultan with a regent. I got friends in high places. places. (laughs) And when my son's 11, maybe we'll do a coup. Oh no, don't Google it. (laughs) No, but the timing is almost too perfect for this. About a year after coming to the throne the second time, Mustafa starts to get paranoid. Mm -hmm. Again, can we blame him? He's not mentally well. And he was like, okay, I think we need to murder anybody that was involved in Osman's assassination. Yeah, because that's the solution. Murder everyone. (laughs) Um, but that would have also, since Kosum had been implicated, he was like including Kosum and her kids. Yeah. And if you'll remember, Kosum has made friends with the Sultan's personal army, the <laughs> Janissaries. Oh my God. We have to imagine that she sent them some Starbucks. She was like, Frappuccinos on me, everybody. <laughs> and so someone came to her at the Palace of Tears and is like, the time has come. The time has come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, hey, Kosum, your sons are old enough now. They are the ripe old age of 11, old enough to be the king. You ain't doing shit here at the Palace of Tears. Will you support this coup? And will you come back and be regent? A coup, y'all? <laughs> and that's when she's like... Hold my frappuccino. Let's do this. Channels Shania Twain and is like, let's go, girls. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to take a quick break and top off my mocktail. And I can't wait to get to the rest of this story. We'll be right back. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's Takuya here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well... I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. 
It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. Okay. So Mustafa is overthrown again, uh, and he's sent back to the coffice again. Uh, but now Kosum has a new title as Valid Sultan. And what does Valid Sultan mean? Basically, Queen Mother. Yeah. It was the mother of the Sultan, and it was a very, very powerful position at court. With Kosum, this position reached a level of power that had never been seen before. She is kind of like the pinnacle of this century of women being powerful in the Ottoman Empire. Momagers. Momagers. <laughs> just, she is just like... Chris Jenner, I got this. Because she is going to be full-blown regent for her 11-year-old son, which we've never seen before. His name is Murad. And since this was not usually the done thing, it gives us a glimpse into just how respected Kosem was by the people, both inside and outside the government. Yeah. A Venetian dignitary that was visiting wrote about her, and he said, quote-unquote, we have great hopes for Kosem. She is distinguished by maturity and character. So, all around... Everyone's got good vibes. Yeah. Vibes, drinking coffee, not killing their brothers. What can <laughs> Yay, go wrong? this is a good time. So her entrance back into Constantinople and the palace was this huge, over-the-top affair. And I just, I love to see it. I, I love thinking of her being like, yes, back where I should be. And the people are eating it up because they've had Mustafa for the last years. And she's like, all right, mama's home. (laughs) When you're good to mama, mama's Mama's good good to to you. you. (laughs) So Kosem probably hoped that Murad would allow her sons to live at court. But everyone agreed that it would probably just be too far gone from tradition. So... Her other three remaining sons were put in the 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 ye the cage. old cage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> where she made sure that they were treated as well as they could be and asked the retired concubines to go and try to give them some form of an education and they were locked up. Yeah. But hey, locked up sons are better than dead sons, right? Okay. Okay, true. Yeah. True. Yeah. I'll give you that. So Kosum is totally in charge now but because history is a bag of dicks as many important historians have once said Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she attended all of the cabinet meetings from behind a curtain Nathan where have we seen that before Chinese culture all the time yeah (laughs) Emperor Sichi was behind the curtain Mm -hmm. for so much of her time as regent I just don't understand like she's not Everyone knows she's there, and everyone yeah. knows. Are they just like, ooh, I'm going to get cooties if I sit with a girl and there's not a curtain. I don't, whatever. That's exactly whatever. what happened. Empress Wu vibe here. So yes, like, yes. You know I'm behind this curtain. Right? You know I'm here, right? Yeah. <laughs> what you need to know is that over the next few years is Kosem is running the Ottoman Empire, per use, and yes. she's involved in politics. She's supporting grand visors she's supporting the execution of grand visors when she has to there's this one story of a grand visor that just wronged somebody and so they just threw him 
to an angry mob and let the angry mob angry mob him to death. It was Oh, this is not great. Sixteenth oh, century or seventeenth century, wherever we are now, not a great time to be alive. No. But Yes. When the Janissaries complained about not having enough money, she took gold items in the palace and melted them down to pay the Janissaries. Because she's like, oh, we got to keep these folks happy. Otherwise, they're going to do a coup part two, you know? <laughs> coup part two. Coup part two. <laughs> she's arranging political marriages for all the royal daughters. So they have ties in places like Egypt. She's making treaties with Spain. She is a busy, she is moving and shaking and wheeling and dealing, and we love to see it. Yeah. And over the years, as Murad got older, he started to resent his mother a little bit for her power. We've seen that before. Uh, maybe a time or 12. We got a Nero. <laughs> we got a, what was Catherine the Great's son name? Exactly. No one knows because he sucked. Uh, very forget it. We got the very forgettable guy that was Catherine the Great's son. <laughs> I got Catherine de Medici. These guys are like, uh, oh, my mom, shut up. It's like, she's a badass. Maybe you should listen to her. Yeah, maybe. maybe. But she did really run everything for a good nine years until it all came to a screeching halt in 1632. Murad decided that he was old enough. And to be fair, he was 20 at this point, which back then... Ancient. I feel like, yes, it's <laughs> older than it is now. And he replaced all of his mom's friends in the government. And that that's when, when I was talking about earlier when they threw the guy to the angry mob. He threw the grand visor to the angry mob. Um, that grand visor was a big supporter of his mother. So he's sending a clear message like, mom, your time here is done. Yeah, but I guess he thought that this wasn't going to send a strong enough message to his mom. So Murad ordered the one thing Kosem had feared the most. He ordered his three brothers dead. Oh, we know Kosem protested, but we don't know the details. But I have to imagine if it was me, I'd be hysterical, you know? Yeah. They are your brothers. They're your full brothers. Y'all were raised together. What? How How can you do this? And it seemed like she persuaded him not to kill him for a good yeah. five years. It went back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, she's kicking the can down the road, and that can, <laughs> that can is yield death. And <laughs> <laughs> yield fratricide. Yeah. And Kosum tried to keep out of politics and not, you know, give her two cents whenever she wasn't asked though she was still a a staple at court she would act as regent still when murad was away yeah so he's kind of sending mixed messages to her don't get involved unless i need you to be involved (laughs) so like i imagine she's just kind of like walking this tightrope of whatever you say just don't kill your brothers you know um yeah not a a hard ask (laughs) no no but Murad had made up his mind. So she was like, look, just my youngest son, Ibrahim. Ibrahim was 22 and he'd been in the Kafis since he was eight years old. Ugh. And even before the Kafis, he Ibrahim wasn't um, as mentally capable as the rest of his brothers. We don't know what he suffered from, but today we'd say he had some kind of mental disability yeah and kosem was like please 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 spare baby abraham he's not a threat no one is ever going to back him against you he's never gonna father any children so she of course is begging for her youngest son's life and murad thankfully agrees though he did have two others executed. He did have the other two silk roped. Silk roped. <laughs> so we don't have an official record of exactly how she took the news, but we have to imagine when she found out it wasn't it wasn't great. <laughs> I read this one thing. So all the concubines were going to some kind of like retreat together. <laughs> A concubine retreat. Uh, I need this in my life. <laughs> And there was like 13 carriages just full of concubines and their stuff. And he wait, uh, Murad waited for that. So she was like preoccupied with something else. And that's when he executed the brothers. 
Ooh, whoa, shady lady. I'm a snark. <laughs> yes, shady lady, Murad, come on. <laughs> so let's fast forward two years. Zoop. And Murad is on his deathbed. And talk about irony. He doesn't have a single living son. Um, the only male heir in this whole equation is Ibrahim. <laughs> Because Murad had sons that all died. Mm -hmm. So I do have to, I do believe in karma. Yeah, it's a bitch. Story goes that on his deathbed, deathbed, Murad said to his mom, look, you gotta, you gotta murder Ibrahim. It would be better for the empire to go into a succession crisis or have our dynasty end than have someone who's quote unquote mad on the throne. Mm Mm-hmm. But what is the one personality trait we know about Kosum right now? Who does she love the most in the world? Mm, sons. Her babies. Yeah. Do you think she agreed to this? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Ibrahim in inherits, she gets to still be valid sultan. Oh, so wait. So we're going to leave you a... Oh, don't Google it. Don't, don't Google, Google it. it because We're going to leave you on a cliffhanger. Some Somebody's up to some business. <laughs> somebody's being sneaky. I don't like I don't know if she ever answered him. I don't I'm know if she was like, snake. I'm all smart. <laughs> I don't know if she was just like, totally, totally going to kill him. Don't you worry about it. You just go ahead and die. Or or if she told him, no, I'm not going to. We don't know. But uh yeah. That's where we're going to leave her. That's where we're going to leave her for today. <laughs> Nathan, I will talk to you soon. Cheers, bitches. Cheers. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like more Queen's content, we do have a Patreon page with lots of never before heard on the main feed episodes. So go check that out. We also have a merch store and we would love to to see you guys following us on Instagram. That would just be great. And if you would like to advertise on this podcast, reach out. Do you love history but hate when it's stuffy and boring? Well, look no further and join me, Katie Charlwood, your friend, the neighborhood social scientist and reader of books as I delve into unsolved historical mysteries, murders by gaslight, and of course, Women who have been misrepresented through all time. On Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.